And welcome back to the MVP podcast, everyone. We are again in the quarantine files of our podcast, and we have a very special guest today, Melissa Dupont. Melissa, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, James. Of course. We, uh, you know, I, I feel like we are amongst royalty here. You know, you've built a nice career as being a, uh, a marketing strat- strategist known for your uh, crazy ideas, your partnership, outstanding, <laughs> outstanding uh, thinking, as well as um, being able to drive results for your, uh, for your marketing efforts. And uh, most recently as the vice president of international marketing with Sony Pictures. So thank you very much for having, uh, for being on the show, I should say. Thank you. I'm, um, yeah, this is a this is a really crazy time. Uh, I think the good part is it's giving, at least for me, it's giving me a chance to kind of have the solitude to explore new stuff and to look at, you know, um, to be creative and uh, and uh, you know do this is you know to do this interview. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned uh, the creativity part as someone who um, you know us collectively at MVP are creative technologists, right? But I would say as a marketer uh, and and the overall sort of uh, society, you know, coming into this pandemic, I personally felt uh, within the first, oh, geez, maybe the first three to four weeks that I was at a real creative stunt. And and I didn't, I, you know, we, we tried to kind of regroup as a team here and, and pivot and think about new, new strategies and new technology. And, and I struggled early on, but, uh, you know, it seemed like the, the, the fog has cleared to a degree and, and we've been able to spin out, uh, some pretty neat things, but, uh, how about yourself? I mean, you know, as someone that has constantly had to think creatively and, and really market for large brands and mo- uh, movies. And so when things go on hold, you know, how, how did you kind of, uh, spur your, your creativity back up? I think for me, it was about, it's about, you know, uh, cause prior, I actually, when COVID started, um, I was in Kuala Lumpur in December and then it really, I was in the hot spot in, I went through sing, um, Hong Kong for a movie. Um, I was, uh, did an activation in Singapore off the coast on Sentosa Island in Singapore. And, you know, so I feel like I felt kind of the COVID, um, the virus, the COVID-19 stuff early on. Mm -hmm. So as I was coming back, um, there was a lag on what was, you know, then it hit Italy, Europe, and then the United States. Sure. So, uh, my brain went immediately to like, this is serious because early February, even at my hotel, I was getting my temperature taken. We were washing our hands. You know, the Singaporean government was definitely giving guidelines because they were so experienced with SARS. Sure. So I kind of, when I was coming back, I was literally like, oh, movie theaters, you know, depending on how the U.S. handles this, movie theaters are, and uh, other places that people congregate are really going to be challenged. Um, From a creative standpoint, my brain went to... um, you know, I'm monitor. I was kind of monitoring what the situation was. And then I, my brain was going to like, how can, how can we use my skills? How can I help? Um, how can I solve problems? Are drive-in theaters going to come back, which is actually happening. A lot of people are doing drive-in initiatives. Uh, my husband, who is very technical and, uh, he's giving a lot of sound support to, and, uh, engineering support, uh, to, um, uh, to a lot of online activations. Um, but he was immediately like, Oh yeah, you can, we could do a drive, you know, we could do a drive in, you can just run it through, you know, uh, you can run it through your phone. And so I guess my point is, is that, you know, whatever creatively, um, you know, uh, uh, skills or ideas that I had, I was just thinking like, how can we apply them to, you know, help out and to pitch into what's happening now. Sure. And that was sure. really early. That was early on. Yeah, that that's interesting. I mean, talk about having a, a, the, 
uh, the foresight of what was coming when you were overseas uh, like that uh, must have been an interesting scenario. And and we'll actually get into why uh, you were you were uh, mm-hmm. overseas um, uh, once we kind of talk a, b- a little bit more about your background. And so uh, the new listeners um, and and old listeners are aware that um, you know we try to talk about all things experiential marketing, in particular uh, with technology as well as uh, other startup business and entrepreneurial type of topics. But, uh, you know, what's so exciting uh, about having you on in particular is you really speak our language and and you have a really, uh, you know, an over 12 year career in experiential and, um, you know, really driving value for brands. So why don't you walk us through a little bit of your career and and actually how you uh, ended up and uh, maybe some of the things you, you are doing or have done for Sony Pictures? Sure. Uh, well, I'm a military brat. Um, uh, so I kind of grew up everywhere, all over the country, Oklahoma, San Francisco, you know, um, Germany. Um, uh, my mother is Japanese. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a very m- kind of multicultural background and, um, I was always drawn to visual arts, um, and spe- specifically intrigued with good design. So especially if it was smart or clever or surprising or funny, and then I began my career in San Francisco and New York, working at the um, the Mad Men type agencies of Great Global and McCann Erickson uh, back in the 90s. Uh, and I worked on everything in, I was an art director and creative director. So I worked on consumer packaged goods from cereal to, to Hasbro to over the counter foot fungus cream, you name it. Um, that sounds a I lot also, of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, I think it was, you know, it was definitely, it was, um, I always found like the stuff that nobody cared about was the thing that you could do the most creative stuff with. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. And it was a brand with a yellow can. And so we put everybody, we put, um, like construction workers and, and military guys in yellow fuzzy slippers. I remember that was the campaign. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I also had a small design studio doing advertising and retail after that. I was doing retail packaging for sporting goods um, and then uh, I was so lucky to get a job running the um, photo department at NBC Television uh, in the old days where, um, you know, I worked on TV shows and sports and the Olympics and news. And um, that was a creative direction uh, job kind of helping um, and producing photo shoots that provided the assets for all of the NBC marketing um, on in Burbank and in 30 Rock. Okay. Um, and then, so there I was poached from Sony Pictures um, where I then did the same job. Um, I was producing shoots for, you know, James Bond and Spider-Man with filmmakers and actors. And um, because I was becoming such a specialist in that part of my career, uh, I was always intrigued, as I said earlier, with international business. So a position opened up in marketing for a strategy position. and. And one thing being a visual arts creative, I just, I liked problem solving. Um, And the thing I was always missing, and I went to business school, was how to quantify any visual executions or creative executions, really how to quantify it from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. So this position opened up in international marketing. um, And the guy who ran it, Sal Industrial, he's absolutely just brilliant. Um, he's, he's pretty much a legend in terms of the, um, movie world. Uh, you know, he brought Crouching Tiger to the United States. He worked on Django Unchained, um, Capote, Kung Fu Hustle, all these kind of, um, you know, highly, uh, lauded movies that were art house. And, um, and he was working on a movie called Whiplash, and I threw my hat in the ring and he knew me from, you know, he was a stakeholder of mine when I ran photography and I wrote a plan for Whiplash International and he took a chance on me and gave me a job. So from then I became, um, you know, his, uh, VP of International Marketing where I did strategy, but I also did, you know, activations. I also um you know, I was, we were kind of an entrepreneurial smaller department because the types of movies we worked on. So uh, we worked on Don't Breathe, Call Me By Your Name, 
searching. So whether it was genre movies, horror movies, independent movies, auteur movies, most recently Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Tarantino, um, you know, that was kind of the, um, those are the kinds of movies we worked on that required a real specialty type of marketing. Sure, sure. Well, that last movie I, I recently had watched not too long ago, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I thought it was phenomenal in the perfect blend of uh, reality and fiction and, and you using current events to, uh, to a degree to kind of weave that into the story. And of course, Tarantino is a, is a master at what he does. But so, you know, what I find interesting, and it's got to be a particular challenge, but it sounds like you were almost, you know, uh, subconsciously prepared to really uh, view the, the world in an international sense, you know, um, in, in how you were raised and being a military brat and understanding travel. And so when uh, you look to market a release of a movie, now is this something that you have one particular region that you have to focus internationally or is it Asia and Europe and, you know, all over? And what does that do to your planning and execution, knowing cultural differences and, you know, what it could be accepted in one culture is, is taboo in another. And so, uh, talk through that and, and please share any experiences that, um, good or bad, uh, that you yeah. had seen that kind of, um, scenario. Well, actually, you know, when I worked back at gray, I did work, do some international work. Um, so, uh, I, I, I worked on, uh, games and, what you, what I er, early in my career found out or just understood inherently and also having a Japanese mother was just that, you know, the everyone's paradigm in different countries, um, I, I call it American glasses, but um, each country, they wear their own glasses. And mm. they, you know, they, that's to me, um, you know, I, I use that term because when I do interact in, you know, with different countries and different um, people, I have to always remember consciously that uh, I have to get that emotional quotient and that international um, kind of mindset. Uh, I have to consciously put it on and take off my American glasses. Sure. So I love um, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's about, uh, so what ends up happening strategically um, is, you know, there's some core, you know, treating the film like a product, there's some kind of core, you know, you do your traditional, you know, strengths and weaknesses and evaluations and, and research. Um, positioning is key. But uh, so if you position a particular movie, like this movie is X, and you know, here's the story, there are some universal truths, but in your market positioning, you keep it flexible enough so that in the territories, in the markets, um, and when you, you know, and I do, I did work on APAC, EMEA, you know, everywhere, LATAM. Um, there's enough, uh, you kind of have to give up a lot of control in that, uh, they, you know, I'm not going to tell somebody in Mexico what Mexican values are. So, in your marketing position, you make it broad enough, flexible enough that they can adapt and tailor. Sometimes you have multiple positionings. Um, and, uh, you know, LATAM is a family market when it comes to films. Family, family values, that matters. Um, you know, Russia is an action market. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some, there's some, there are some kind of rules and idiosyncrasies, but um, there's no hard rules. Okay. Uh, surprises happen all the time. Um, now, with I think one the one thing... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was just thinking, you know, in terms of, say, one release for a particular movie, did w have you executed uh, two completely different activations in, in different markets, uh, you know, with maybe the, that overlining overarching theme that you had mentioned there in terms of the. Yeah. Um, so sometimes when we, you know, that's the, the scalability of um, of the marketing position and objectives. Um, yes, uh, that probably leads into, um, I would say we did, uh, well, let me go back to the positioning. So we had a movie called baby driver mm -hmm. and baby driver was it, it one that's a challenging title. So it doesn't always translate well. 
so the um, the ter you know the the leader the the marketing leadership in that territory kind of advises on a different name, um, and it's not necessarily execution, but it was positioning. So, for example, on Baby Driver uh, in France, it was a romantic heist getaway, sexy movie. Mm -hmm. um, in LATAM, there are, um, you know, the research showed there are tons of gearheads. They were all about the cars. Okay. And the so, so for some of us ignorant people, LATAM, uh, could you Latin help? Latin America. It? Okay. Got it. Got it. So Latin America uh, is uh, the region. Uh, and in Latin America, what is kind of unique is there's Brazil. And Brazil, from a marketing standpoint, culturally, it's, it's, it's kind of an island within LATAM. They don't speak the same language. And so, um, so when I refer to Land Am, it, it's the region. Um, and EMEA, obviously, Europe, Africa, um, and then APAC, Asia PAC, Australia, uh, Asia. So I'm, if I'm talking about the regions, but. Great. Thank you uh, for that. that. That's very helpful yeah, for yeah. a lot of listeners. Yeah. So now we know I'm going to say yeah. Land Am constantly. Yeah. I mean, I think in the United States, you have the same kind of, you know, regionalities, you know, obviously I've lived on both coasts and, um, you know, definitely. So if you think of it as the regionalities of a large country like the United States, it still applies. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, there's Port Portland, you know, Portlandia, Portland's <laughs> quirkiness. Uh, you have Texas, but then you have Austin in the middle. So sure, um, sure. the cultural nuances. Um, but you know, going back to Baby Driver, my overall point was just that uh, you you emphasize different things. Uh, there was the music in the UK. Music is such an, you know, uh, the director was British. So there were different things and different attributes we could lean into. So executionally, um, in uh, we did in Singapore, which was about the the romance and the sexiness of the lead stars. Uh, it was just a full on premiere and they had, we had brought talent there and did a big mall visit and really um, approached uh, the lead actors because they were young and sexy in, in a matinee idol approach. But in Mexico, we ended up doing a car junket and meaning we brought in the stunt driver, um, Jeremy Fry. He's one of the best, you know, most famous stunt drivers. And uh, we brought the cast and then we did, we brought in um, car magazines Latin, from Mexico, it was in Mexico City. And then for content and influencers, we had um, everyone go-kart race with the talent, the director oh, how fun. and the set driver. Yeah. And then that, so that was, you know, those are an example of two very different executions, um, very simple executions. Yeah. You know, and, um, I, and I actually love that you had referenced the, the music because the one thing that points out to me with the movie Baby Driver is the soundtrack. And actually in, in my, you know, so, small circle of friends that, uh, you know, enjoy um, movies, that was the calling card is like, oh, the soundtrack really made the movie. And so it was yeah. interesting that you had said that, you know, the UK's deep history and <laughs> with rock and roll and indie music and uh, all the cultural influence that uh, music has played there uh, made a lot of sense. And so, so what, what type of programming or activations did you do there um, tied into the music? Was there anything yeah, yeah, we basically, um, and I mean, Once Upon Time is another example uh, in terms of music, but in the UK, we really promoted the soundtrack. If you looked at the soundtrack on Baby Driver, I don't even know if you, they were deep cuts and B-sides. And so we had to really do, uh, you know, radio, uh, terrestrial radio, shockingly, is still huge in the UK and um, as well as it's a newspaper culture. So uh, we really leaned heavily into promoting the album there, having the cast, um, you know, autograph albums, uh, do uh, playlists, uh, listener parties, um, you know, really kind of old, we would call here in the United States, old style traditional radio promotion. Sure. But it, it fit, it really fit. Yeah, I'm looking at the soundtrack now, and you want to talk about Deep Cut. You even have Young MC, and it's not the popular song, Bust a Move. It is uh -uh. Know, know How. 
which mm-hmm. I, I couldn't tell you what that sounded like, but yeah. it, it, it's a great playlist and uh, highly recommended. I mean, obviously watch the movie, but, um, you know, I thought the music was woven in perfectly to the action and, uh, you know, the setting of the movie and, and everything. So, um, so that, that's, that's really cool. So have you had other experiences? Talk to us a little bit about, um, some of your other favorite activations that, you know, uh, obviously we're a technology company and we, we drive, uh, you know, a lot of our engagements through the lens of technology. But one of the things that we really, um, try to talk to our brands about or our clients is, yeah, you know, we're constantly tech first, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to shoehorn technology. And sometimes analog experiences are just as effective and fun. And, you know, when you can merge the two, that's, you know, in my opinion, that's where the magic really happens because it's both tactical and, um, you know, futuristic and all of that. But um, so maybe tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, that range, you know, of uh, activations that you, you know, were pretty analog and, and maybe pressing the, the limits on tech. Yeah, well, I'll start with I've done, like you said, I've done stuff. Um, there was a, a movie Resident Evil where, uh, you know, Sony R- R&D in Tokyo uh, opened kind of the vault to me and, and showed me some really cool technology they were developing um, like high, in early, early stages. Um, uh, and uh, my part, my kind of partner in crime over there, who was the biz dev person, um, he was like, come over. I'm going to show you a range of technology and resident evil was probably, you know, it's Mila Jovovich. It was probably number four or five in the franchise, very popular game, but there were rabid international fans. Um, And um, Hiro O'Hara, uh, the biz dev person uh, basically gave me this deep, deep tour of Sony engineering and you would go into these rooms and they look like garages and these guys were just tinkering and being creative and 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 these engineering geniuses were mm-hmm. making some phenomenal things um one thing that was happening in the audio department was they were playing with haptics but from an uh, and i always thought haptics like on your phone i always you know the vibrating and um i always thought i don't know why i always thought as you know a non-engineer it was a mechanism it was a physical mechanism of vibrating, mm-hmm. but the way the, actually the haptics that they had were all audio. So they had embedded multiple speakers into a vest and uh, you would feel the vibrations and the pings uh, from, you know, and then match it to a visual. Well, what they were missing was the visual. So for me, my marketing problem was I had a, a matured franchise with zombies um and uh i wanted to really create um it had a gamification sense to it because resident evil the movie and resident evil the game um fans of the game weren't that interested in the movie and fans of the movie were not actually in a lot of markets interested in the game but uh and so how could i revive get something newsworthy um create content and use Sony technology. So basically we created a fake game where you put on this vest, you, we got the filmmakers to provide us the CGI zombies. You played the, you, you played the game um, as a consumer. You didn't know the game was rigged, but, uh, and you wore a vest and you started to feel the zombies killing you. No, I love that. Yeah. That's so uh, talk about a 4d experience, right? Yeah. And it was totally like people were screaming. I mean, as a studio, from a marketing standpoint, we got great content. We got to showcase showcase Sony tech early Sony tech that hadn't even gone out. You know, that wasn't ready. Uh, you know, to go to market yet. Um, and then I got a layer of earned media value. I got the talent to do it, and it was integrated with you know high level CGI from the movie. So it was kind of this perfect um, storm. And then as we talked about, uh, it was scalable. So we went to movie theaters, we went to India, uh, Spain, Mexico, uh, Japan. Uh, I can't even remember it all, but because sure. it was such a blur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So how, then, how many and, total vests did you travel with? I mean, were you have you know, freight loads? Uh, or? 
I think we traveled with more engineers than vests okay. because the vests would die. <laughs> so it was probably like 10 vests and it was long days. Um, because people thought they could win the game and they couldn't, sure. but the thing was, uh, no, it, and also too, it was the challenge of moving high, high level equipment. You know, uh, we were going to go to Brazil comic con and, and through different countries and the logistics of that. And then having these engineers who, although speak English, you know, it's not their first language, these mm -hmm. Japanese engineers, but a lot of them got to travel the world for the first time. Um, they got to see people having an emotional and physical reaction and sure. screaming and laughing uh, to work uh, that they had been de developing for years in the, um, you know, in the recesses of, of uh, <laughs> Sony engineering and R&D. Yeah, you know, imagine getting that project brief across your desk and, you know, you're six weeks into developing something and you just not know how the heck this is going. Like, what am I even doing? And then you finally see the culmination of your work. Yeah. Uh, it's very cool. And I thought it was interesting that you had mentioned sound because just, just recently... Um, you know, we do, we work within a lot of touch screens, right? And so given the environment, there's a lot of sensitivities with germs and people wanting or wanting to avoid, you know, <laughs> touching any particular surface. And so we've been doing a lot of research and um, development in gesture control, right? So you want to, you know, be able to use your hand movements in your body to control a piece of content. And so, you know, traditionally we would use 3D cameras you know, most popular, the, the, the Microsoft Connect camera is, is probably one of the ones that we repeatedly use. But, you know, there's advancements in all, all the types of um, gesture registration. And so we recently came across a platform that uses radio frequency to break the plane of where you're moving. So that is wow. the tracking module. And I was just so blown away that I, I would have never thought for a second, you know, infrared light, you you know, sure, that all day long. But, um, you know, so radio, audio. audio, yeah. So I thought that was uh, really, really interesting. And so... Yeah, you don't think of audio as being able to constrain anybody. You just at least... And, you know, it's so funny because I... My husband was a sound engineer, dialogue editor for Rugrats for a long time and sound engineer for Universal. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, well, what happened from that and also, too, we did I had the advantage of, uh, you know, I had Sony projectors and Sony, you know, we had all these fantastic products. So that was a good activation that really. Um, and then the more important thing from the from the marketing standpoint is the earned media value, we got great stories, we got influencers, the talent. So it was it was scalable and special. And then that actually evolved into, I was like, again, my colleague, uh, Hiro Hara, who's a genius, I think he's at Rakuten now, but he's amazing. But he, and we actually won the chair, Kazurai gave us an award mm. for this collaboration. It was cool, the chairman of Sony. But um, that actually evolved into, I was, we were both like, we had another movie, Insidious, and it was either number four in the franchise. It was a, 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 a horror movie. And both, he was like, and I was too, he was like, hey, if we could haptize one experience, I said, could we haptize the whole movie? So we evolved that into having, instead of 10 vests, I was like, can you make a hundred vests? <laughs> and we put them in theater and then you orchestrate the entire movie yes. um, to feel the jumps and the, you know, to really feel the jumps and the you know, scares and, um, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, create an experience where everybody wears these vests. The challenge there from an audio standpoint was how do you had to actually orchestrate the haptics so that you didn't foreshadow the scares and ruin it for the audience. Right, right. Yeah, so, you, you didn't want to telegraph a uh, someone jumping out of it. Right. <laughs> and you could actually play jokes on them, too, where they didn't think it was coming. And then they were like, uh, and that we did, we launched in Hong Kong. And, you know, Asia, in Asia, a lot of audiences um, don't, react in a big way. Um, mm. When I was young, I saw Empire Strikes Back in, in, in Tokyo, or I'm sorry, in Osaka, in a theater. And it was the first time people, they clap, but there's very, they're very polite. They don't laugh out loud. They don't sure. have big reactions. What was great about this haptics vest uh, experience 
was they were squeaking and yelling and cringing. <laughs> and you saw a lot more emotionality than you normally do in Hong Kong audiences. Um, and then we also took it to Mexico and Mexico. And again, the engineering challenges there, uh, you know, again, just moving things into Mexico and, and with Japanese engineers, but, um, the audiences were there lined up around the corner. They were like, we're in, this is like, yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. almost like a theme park experience. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So those are my, probably my two biggest techie ones. And then sometimes you just got to go lo-fi and, yeah. um, you know, for me, it was, uh, uh, I had a movie called Escape Room uh, where uh, there was no there was no real known talent and it was a young director, but the room was really innovative and the concept of Escape Room was sticky. And so what we did, um, and also the movie was launching in January, which, you know, January movies, if you don't have a big star or a lot of what we call theatricality, um, you know, uh, you, you really have to put on your marketing hat because people are cooked from seeing all the movies in December back to school. So, uh, for escape room, uh, TikTok was really emerging as just a, uh, you know, a, a great social platform. So, uh, I do a lot of influencer creator campaigns and, um, this was the first one TikTok had ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, they had never partnered with a movie before. So what we did um, is we took TikTok influencers, I think, from 17 countries. So we had 20 plus uh, TikTok influencers from around the world, brought them into Madrid in January, and then had built a escape room. And the escape room essentially was very lo-fi, <laughs> meaning, uh, you know, they had to complete some challenges. But, uh, you know, we in the movie, there's a room where the walls start collapsing if the, if the victims don't solve a problem. But um, in real life, we had, you know, two guy, two construction workers behind these, this wall and they were pushing the wall in, uh, <laughs> you know, and laughing and then, you know, uh, there was, um, we had to drop, we did a thing where if you didn't answer a question at the end, the pinnacle was, um, if you didn't answer the right questions about just like in the movie, uh, you drop through a trap door, um, you know, about nine feet. So uh, that was kind of an example of a low tech uh, version of, um, you know, doing an activation with influencers. Yep. Well, it's always about the front of the house, right? It doesn't, ma it doesn't yeah. matter how it works and what's happening. It could be a hamster in a wheel <laughs> running the engagement. Yeah. But as long as the experience is good and the customers or the consumers are having fun, I mean, that's yeah. what it's all about. So, yeah. yeah, you know, even on our tech side, we can relate to some of those lo-fi <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, powerable uh, engagements where, you know, behind the scenes, it's one thing, but uh, on the front of the house, it's, it's a fun yeah. experience. And that's all, yeah. that's all that really matters. So, yeah. let, so let me ask you this, you know, obviously with movies in particular, um, you know, I, I think as an industry, you see such a, a, a far wide and scalable promotion um, and, and media buy of big release movies, anything from your traditional billboards and your print ads, you know, to um, TV junkets, as you had mentioned. And, and from our purview and, and where, you know, the industries that, that we involved in, you know, how would you say over your career that experiential marketing has become, you know, maybe you know, 10 years ago, it was a bit of a niche thing. You do something stunty, you, you maybe do a, 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 you know, a station domination or something along those lines, hand out tchotchkes, but talk about the evolution of, of experiential marketing in the movie business, um, from your experience. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think the evolution of it is, you know, I feel like as a marketer, my only job really, because of the nature of the economics of, you make 50% of your box office uh, gross the first weekend you open, no matter what country you're in, wow. is my job is to create FOMO, is to create fear of missing out, as the kids say, sure. uh, to create an urgency. And so I think with, um, you're, you're absolutely right, the experiential part has evolved, I think, one, with the fragmentation of media, gen, uh, meaning, you know, uh, traditional advertising, uh, 
doesn't really work in the sense, uh, you know, obfuscation used to be the, uh, if you had a not so great movie, you kind of hide it in the trailer. But then the rise of social media, I mean, how many times have we all gone to a movie and we're like, oh, that's not like the trailer. Right. So the rise of social media and which means the rise of accountability to filmmakers and movie studios that uh, word of mouth, you know, Twitter will kill a movie. Everything will kill a movie. So I think there's that. I think fragmentation you know, traditional advertising, streamers, mobile, the evolution of mobile, definitely. I think um, experiential just shot off. I think once the digital natives of Gen Z and mobile smartphones and cameras got really good, I think that's when experiential marketing was required to break through. Right, right. In my opinion. Um, so you couldn't, you know, it, remember the unboxing videos? I mean, they still happen, but I think when people were able to broadcast their opinions themselves in a high quality way through the mobile phone, I think it was, it was, it, in my opinion, absolutely essential as marketers uh, in order to create that FOMO was, um, and it's coincidentally my background's photography. So I'm always sure. about the shot or I'm always about the visual because it's the quickest delivery of the message. But I think that's when experiential is requi- was required. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah I, so. I, I agree with you because, you know, I, what I like to say, you know, back in 2008 or right on the onset of the iPhone where apps was the big rage and, you know, there was just, it was going to change our way of life. And, you know, we had seen a trend in where brands were looking to capitalize on that, but the delivery methods were fairly limited in, in terms of what you can do. I mean, uh, who's going to download the Sony picture app, right? For the hell of it, you know, that's, that, that was, that's right. a tough ask, but what it did was open up the eyes of technology and engagement, knowing that, our culture has shifted and changed because we're now, you know, leveraging a, a handheld computer to interface with on a daily basis. And so to me, that felt like the, the onsite and growth of experiential and, and shareability and, and memory in terms of using technology, these brands getting behind it to promote their product or uh, services and consumers being able to interact with them in a much different way. And so, um, you know, and that's, it's still fairly new. I mean, we're, we're under 15 years. I mean, heck, I think 2008, <laughs> I mean, it's 12 yeah. years ago. And so it's, it's still very new and early and, and exciting because I think as technologists, even over the last five years, you've seen so many different technologies come come to front and um you know some even die you know <laughs> they yeah. come and go right yeah. and so so um you know speaking about the past i mean th- this is always a challenging question when looking forward to the future but where do you see and and who knows what the new normal is going to look like but in terms of where our current environment is and in the the movie industry where do you see marketing efforts heading uh, maybe in the short term and then maybe 12 to 18 months from now? I mean, I think going off of your, actually the perfect lead in was your experiential question. Um, I personally think that, you know, with programmatic ad buying now, you know, of traditional, you know, the old way of buying media is gone. And if as a marketer, your competitors can afford programmatic media buying, then you need to find different ways to go beyond that. And I think, again, uh, you know, uh, experiential is really the goal for marketers really is uh, unique content, user generated content. Um, You want to kind of my I always think I want to create a you want to create cool or trending or viral, which is pretty impossible because the audience determines that. Sure. But I think experiential is going to is is so essential one because it creates a perception of ubiquity but it's still special mm-hmm. and then that creates kind of the hype and that I think that is what was required since traditional paid advertising and paid media mm-hmm. is programmatic so if you want to be competitive 
sure, you got to do programmatic, make sure your advertising or your communi your marketing communications are being received by the right audience. But I think you have to go beyond that to be competitive. And you also have to, I think, as a marketer, um, the future of it is we've had to, you know, in the old days, it was about controlling the message. And now I think for me, I have, to, I am okay, you know, brand safety and all that, but you, you have to loosen up a bit more and more um, about the specific narrative in your marketing uh, needs or your content and uh, now allow your marketing narrative strategy to be more dynamic. And I think in that, that's where you start because user generated content is here and it's going to keep going and going and going and it's going to get more sophisticated. Um, I think uh, the thing that I feel like with Gen Z, they're just looking, personalization is so important to them and they're so discriminating and sophisticated. So I just think that you kind of have to up the game but beyond the automated tools and the AI that is coming to you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, and, and just sorry to, not, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but uh, you know, no, I think so, uh, some of the market research too um, has really honed in on, you had mentioned the Gen Z, but the millennial market, which is now the, the coveted, you know, demographic and all. But um, I, I think study after study completely validates that experience uh, far outweighs many, many other things from a traditional consumer standpoint, right? It's less about things for the, the younger generation. It's more about experience. And so when you, I mean, we're all in the experience business to a degree, right? As, as a, a movie house or a studio, you know, you want to create that, that movie experience and bring people out of the homes and into a theater or even, you know, suspend disbelief at home, right? But you want to create that experience. And so when you tie in your marketing efforts to a visceral emotion and memory, it's such a powerful thing because it, it, it lives beyond the 60, 120 minutes of a movie or, or a game, right? And then, of course, you add social to it, and then there's your scalability and amplification and all of that good stuff. Yeah, so. yeah I agree. I think emotional affinity, it's one of the hardest things to do. You know, there are people who love Nike. They are, they are, you know, sneaker heads. Sure. So I think the future of uh, marketing in, in, or at least the opportunities is how do you foster extreme fanship and how do you pay attention to the, how do you get those customers to evangelize beyond like, I, I, I was talking um, to some, you know, I was uh, on the side, I have universe, uh, they were um, bachelor they were sports entertainment bachelor degree um, candidates and their final presentation was on, um, on uh, a sports brand, but they were just talking about sneaker culture. And so that's one thing I think as marketers is as like you said, millennials and, and Gen Z um, the affinities it, or at least the good marketers, the affinities for brands become, you know, how do you get them to become, consumers and evolve into fanship. I think, you know, obviously you're, you know, sports marketing and that sort of thing. Um, you know, fanship is a little more obvious, but to have fanship for a brand, like um, to think of it, uh, you know, like women who love Louis Vuitton sure. or love certain designers, or uh, there's even a brand, there's a movie studio called A24. And they're one of the first movie studios. And I think they're amazing where they are developing their brand. Most people who go to the movies, at least in the past, they don't really know. They know what a Disney picture is, but they don't really know that Paramount and, um, you know, F Fox or, sure. you know, they don't really know that those type, that's a, that's that movie. They know what a Disney movie is. Well, A24 is a small brand. It's a movie studio, but they're really, you know, they're creating a, a slate of movies that are creative, unique, um, auteur, high level art house. But at the same time, they're developing their brand where they're really, um, you know, people really identify their fanship. Oh, I'm an A24 fan. What? Yeah. So, I think, <laughs> yeah. so I think it's, it's, it, it's, it's evolving brand affinity to an emotional level and, and that brings it to extreme fanship. And that's where I think the future of marketing in general is going. But 
what do I know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's so funny that you say that because maybe I'm just an oddball too, but I remember towards the latter half of college and, and that, the, that kind of time frame for me, I would always say Lionsgate films. I loved anytime that there was a Lionsgate film because, you know, they were, you know, a bit indie, uh, big studio slash edgy, you know, it wasn't like yeah. you run in the mill rom-com type of studio, but. Well, what it's funny you mentioned Lionsgate. Uh, I I know two executives there. The president of marketing is uh, Damon Wolf, and uh, the president of Earn Media and Publicity and Content is um, Marie Soliston. And what they have done, to your point, they have also been doing brand building with Lionsgate during this crisis, where they're doing they're presenting movies for free, and they're give you know on YouTube, Dirty Dancing. Oh, wow. uh, they're they're pre creating content that you know Lionsgate as a studio cares about movies, but they also care about people, and they're reinforcing what you're talking about. So there's an emotional affinity. Um, they're creating you know you you see stuff on LinkedIn, but they're creating movie nights and you know really embracing even though you can't go to the theater you can you know they're kind of eventizing showing special movies on youtube yeah. and they're doing a lot of marketing to promote that brand um they're they're another one they're like an a24 where sure. they're starting to build yeah. that so uh I, he'll be happy to hear that you yeah of that. course you know and, <laughs> and, and thanks for the tip because i i have a 10 year old well she's going to be 11 in a couple of weeks but one of um <laughs> one of her interests is really learning about movies that I grew up watching. Right. So last yeah. weekend we watched the back to the future trilogy and like, yeah. so she loves going back in time and, and, and watching the movies because, you know, she's growing up in a ger generation where CGI and, you know, Pixar and all these wonderful uh, advancements in, in cinema are, are right in front of her. So I, I love the fact that she, she kind of goes back and, and can kind of laugh at some of the props and you know some of the uh, some of the movies but in general um you know she can really appreciate the the older movies and so uh dirty dancing's probably a little bit you know beyond her uh, her uh, parental guide there but uh that's a that's a good thing to look into so thank you for yeah. for sharing that um okay so we're we're nearing our time here but I'm going to put you on the spot um because this all kind of came about last night that the the light bulb went off and I'm and I don't, this is, this isn't premeditated for the listeners. You know, I just want to th throw a name out, but this past holiday season, my wife and I went to visit, um, a girlfriend of hers that she went to college with. And, um, it was at that time, you know, it was the first time that I got to meet her, uh, significant other or boyfriend and what have you. And so, uh, he and I hit it off pretty well. And, you know, we, uh, you know, grabbed a beer, uh, you know, down the street from their apartment. And, um, you know, he had told me that he worked for Sony Pictures. And so last night it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, wait a second, this is one in a million. I don't know how many employees it's with 30,000 employees. I don't know. But does the name John Fredberg mean anything to you? John, uh, Friedberg. Fried, Friedberg. Yes. Is he of, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, if it's the same person, <laughs> I, I can't imagine he, there's many John Friedbergs that Friedbergs that work. In uh, he is head of Spiewag. So he actually, um, I worked very closely with him. He actually is head of, um, he acquired. So he, so Sony does, Sony produces movies. They also acquire movies. So That's he him. goes yep. to Sundance, sits in the dark for, I don't know, 20 hours. He's an uh, amazing, really smart guy. And then watches movies one after another and after another, and then decides not only from the creative standpoint and the theatricality of the movie, but um, the uh, kind of the long tail of profitability. And he has to make these decisions really fast. And he basically um, acquires a lot of movies uh, for, yeah, for, um, they call it stage six or Sony pictures worldwide acquisition. So yeah. that's so funny. Isn't that small world? And yeah. you know, it, it, it was, uh, you know, our intention was one beer, but you know, he's such a great person to talk to and oh, you know, fun. we can just riff on different ideas. And so it was the, the first time we hung out and I think it was probably about six beers. <laughs> yeah. So. No, he's, 
Yeah. He's definitely he's one of the smart he's one of the smart guys in the room, and he's also um, he's also a cool guy. He's a really nice guy, and yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. You don't always find that combination in the movie business that yeah. they're smart and nice. Yeah, you know, I I, <laughs> I joked with him. I said, you know, he reminds his personality is very much of a writer. You know, he's got this cynicism about him, and he's sharp and he's quick. I'm like, you should be a writer. <laughs> yeah, and he's also passionate, but I think that's why too. He's such a good deal maker. Yep. Yep. You know. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, that's so funny. Yep. That's so we'll, we'll have to share this when we post it over the weekend. And so Melissa, this was awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Is there anything for our listeners, um, social media or any way to contact you? Is there any method that you yeah. prefer or so go ahead? And- yeah. Well, James, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Of and course. I want to shout out to Natasha as well. So thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, it's fun to, you know, uh, it was really fun to kind of reflect back on all the stuff that I've done. And, uh, you know, some, you know, L.A. and New York, uh, you know, the coast are such a bubble. And um, so it was really fun to look back on the work that I've done um, and and talk about it. Uh, I would say the best way to contact me, um, I do consult. Uh, um, I'm consulting um, with uh, the company's called Summer and Company, and we just provide global film marketing services um, from strategy to you know executions um, for the entire ecosystem of the entertainment industry. Uh, I would say right now the best way to contact me would be on LinkedIn. And I have a weird spelling to my name. It's M-I-L-I-S-S-A and last name DuPont's. And uh, yeah, just link into me. And uh, no, this is this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, James. Awesome. Well, our pleasure. And this will be posted over the weekend. And as you know, um, past listeners, you can find us on SoundCloud, Google Play, all of the fine places, Apple Music that you can uh, listen to podcasts. So we'll get this uploaded. And of course, I'm James Giglio at every social media. You can find MVP Interactive at every social media. And uh, have a nice weekend, everyone. This was great. Thank you, Melissa. 